What is going on, Center City Church? You already know. We are live in our summer studios here for another episode of You Already Know. Yeah. Where I guess the attempt, you said it's Sunday so perfectly. The attempt is really to dive a little bit deeper into Sunday morning and to just give you a little bit more um, context, yeah. I, thought, yeah. idea of what I happens. feel like weeks like this, so the message was a challenging message on Sunday. I appreciate this opportunity because we just get a chance to talk through a little bit more what is hard to hear the first time, or it's just hard to hear the whole message the first time, because at least for me, there was a lot of convicting stuff in there talking about wealth. Um, but one of the things that I love that you were able to do in this message, because James does it in James is kind of make wealth like a neutral thing, like wealth in itself is not good and is not bad. Will you talk just a little bit about what that means and why we tend to interpret it differently? Yeah, we have an obsession with putting googly eyes on stuff. Um, <laughs> as a culture, we want our vacuum cleaners to talk to us like they're human. And we want our computers and doorbells to have relationship with us to some degree. The danger in some of that is we, we take things that don't have a moral conscious. We have things that don't can't make decisions one way or another, and we humanize them to the point that then we can then demonize them. So mm -hmm. all technology is evil, or all money is evil, or um, I mean, you could kind of go down the, the road. Um, and when it comes to finances, often in scripture, it's one of those topics that actually is addressed over and over. You can't mm -hmm. say that the Bible doesn't speak about um, finances. Jesus himself speaks about finances often. Um, but it is one of those things that we learn. Money is not inherently evil. It's how we find ourselves at the, in relationship with money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, um, it's the love of money that's evil. Well, my relationship to money, when, when it gets to a place where it stops becoming a tool and starts becoming this thing that I love or this thing that I serve, this thing that I allow to master me, well, then at that point, of course, then the wealth corrupts and the wealth corrodes. But you have to start from this place, uh, you know, and I believe James does, really, wealth in and of itself is not evil. It's what we do mm -hmm. as it relates to wealth. I love the way that you said that because a lot of us can think that maybe we don't make a lot of money, so this stuff doesn't apply to me because I'm not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. But the way that you said that it has to do with our relationship to money, we can have a relationship to money even if we don't have a lot of it and just the way that we desire it, the way that we see it as an end goal, all of that. So it's, it's a really good reminder that you kind of said it in the way that like all of us in the room are wealthy globally or most people in the room are wealthy globally because we can sit and watch Netflix, which did hit <laughs> a little bit close to home. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with sitting and watching Netflix. Yeah. But we did speak a little bit about um, how um, luxury, the ability to turn things on in order to numb things in us. That is a product of luxury, for lack of a better yeah, term. Yeah, yeah. And just the freedom of time to be able to absolutely. set time aside for entertainment, which is a blessing. That's, again, not a bad thing in itself. Um, but yeah, so just kind of establishing that wealth is neutral. Then your first point was that wealth rots. What does that mean? How is that neutral if it's something that rots? Yeah, so hashtag, you have to blame James. It wasn't like <laughs> I changed the verbiage of that. Like legitimately, James chapter 5, um, verse 1, look here, rich people who um, groan in anguish because of all the terrible things that are ahead of you, your wealth is rotting away. James is trying to paint a picture of the temporary nature of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, even within the scope of a very practical look at wealth, if I have a dollar, the power of that dollar is one day I will spend it. Now, you might be able to save it, which is great, but even saving it, the objective is one day, if I need it, I can spend it. So wealth is temporary. Now, he uses that term terminology rot because he really quickly moves into the idea that if wealth is temporary and I find my heart serving wealth, then that temporary nature of wealth means that now my heart is susceptible to brokenness because to put my faith or hope into anything that's temporary, well, that thing has an expiration date. It's kind of like the milk you put in your fridge, yeah. right? It eventually will rot. Doesn't mean that it's not good, right? Mm -hmm. There's a place where milk is good. Fruits are good. But if they don't 
if you don't steward those things properly and you don't, you're not wise to use them at the right time, it will rot. I actually thought about the message this morning because I had some delicious blackberries in my fridge, but when I pulled them out today, one of them had gone really bad. And then all the ones like right around it had also gotten to the point where they needed to be thrown out because you talked about how things that are rotting tend to bring other things to that place, which I think is an important thing to remember. We don't want to put our hope in something that is not eternal. Like end of the day, nothing is going to save us except for God who is eternal. Um, the next point that you talked about was wealth speaks. And um, there was a, I guess, was it your youth director who My talked about pastor. your senior pastor yeah, yeah. who talked about how your checkbook will say a lot about what you put your faith in. Talk about that a little bit. Cause I thought that was a really fascinating point. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, you know, the way that James phrases it is um, that you will be judged according to this faith that you've placed in your wealth. And the way that my senior pastor used to phrase it, as you said, was show me your checkbook and I'll show you where your heart is. And really the, the central idea, I mean, very much because where we are culturally, that consumer mentality, um, you really can see where people have placed their heart based off of the things that they purchase and the way that they purchase. And again, inherently, it's not negative. This isn't a negative mm -hmm. in and of itself. It just really is a clear indicator and I think if we're wise, we can do the work that's necessary yeah. to examine our purchase history and think, okay, why am I spending so much money on this thing? Is it something that honors and glorifies God? Um, again, there's nothing wrong with taking mm -hmm. good vacations and there's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, um, living within the context of your means. But if you find yourself every six months buying a new house or buying a new car or working for that thing, there's probably a good chance there's some things that it is saying about your soul. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of an invitation for us to do a little bit of homework this week Absolutely. as a church family, because I know at least at my bank, if you log in and look at your statement, it actually makes a pie chart, chart for you and tells you like, this is what percentage of the money that you're spending is going to these different areas. And it's not perfect, but it does kind of break it down to like utilities, entertainment, food, that sort of thing. So you don't even have to necessarily like, get out all of your purchases and see, but to take that time and look, because I feel like it's not just what we're doing with it, but sometimes you might recognize that there's a need underneath that, that you're trying to fill with something that isn't God. Like, why is it that I have this pattern of every six months or so, I really feel like I need a new wardrobe or I don't know, it could be anything, but it's a good opportunity to look yeah. at that and, and really see a personal snapshot of I, how we're using our wealth. I actually like the, the pie chart concept because really we have a tendency within the scope of our uh, finances to often compare ourselves to others where the truth is there is a beauty of being able to um, see the percentages. Well, this percentage of what I do goes to or what I make goes to entertainment or this percentage of what I make goes to fast food. Um, or this percentage of what I make goes to housing. And we're able to then consider, okay, well, maybe I can pull back a little here, or maybe I'm not spending enough here mm -hmm. and um, make those changes based off of my uh, capacity to earn versus comparing myself to the person who's to the right and left. Because that's really where we get a little off kilter. Yeah. And I want to switch modes just briefly as we kind of wrap up, because at the end of the message, you made a point to talk about how in this passage, James make it, makes it clear that God is listening to the people who have been hurt, mistreated. I can't think of the word that I want to use right now um, for the sake of other people to accumulate wealth. Just Will you just speak to those people briefly? Yeah, it's a powerful picture. Um, the, the rich man is encouraged to first listen mm -hmm. um, because the cry of the worker who's been taken advantage of has reached the ear of the Lord of heaven's army. And I, I, I think it's a powerful picture because often when we're in those places that we feel like someone's taking advantage of us or we're being, you know, we're in a season of darkness or brokenness, we feel like nobody hears. Um, I think we're reminded that first and foremost, we can always just know, not that we feel, but we know that God always hears. I mean, and, and you, the psalmist talks about this and um, there's Old Testament writing, New Testament writing, but always 
to this point that God's ear is attentive to the cries of his people. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, the challenge becomes then the children of God, as we navigate even our wealth, that our ears should be attuned to those who are not, uh, you know, first and foremost attuned to the ear of God as it pertains to the stewardship of our finances, but also attuned to the brokenness of the people around us. I think sometimes we forget that generosity is a uh, a characteristic of God that he calls us to reflect in other people, mm -hmm. that we would be generous in, um, in, in considering those who may be around us that are having difficult seasons, that are sitting in places of darkness, that we can play the role, which I cannot wait because I think in two two weeks, because we're not any, I mean, we still got two or three more weeks in this city. We're in the last chapter, but we got a few weeks left. James ends with this really powerful picture that you and I can play a role in rescue. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we're willing to, like he said at the very beginning, be quick to listen and lean in, that we as the church can also be used by God to play that hand of rescue to those who are hurting. Yeah, I'm excited. So do you know where we're headed? Yes. So the next portion, uh, he talks a, a little bit about patience and endurance mm -hmm. um, to give us a little bit of energy to deal with so much of what he just walked for <laughs> five chapters through to, to, to really kind of encourage that patience and endurance. Yeah, and I feel like it's, it's kind of the perfect follow up to this when you think about it. Because if we're talking about wealth rotting and how it doesn't last then he's talking to the people of God about how you can last if you're not putting your faith in your wealth. I'm I'm excited about yeah, it's it. It's going to be really good. Yeah, it's going to be great. So we can't wait to see you guys Sunday at 10 a.m. right here in this building, but in a different room or online. See you then.